Welcome back to my channel. This video I'm very excited for. I've been working on this for a little while now. It's been going on forever because award season has felt like it has been forever. At the time of filming, about a week ago, the Oscars happened and it was fun and exciting and basically the end of the 2023 awards season. So what I decided to do throughout awards season was look and see if critics groups would be able to predict the outcome of the Oscars. So that is our main focus for today. Can critics groups predict the Oscars looking back at the 2023 award season? Now, critics groups are all over the country, all over the world. I decided to look at a bunch of different ones from, you know, Boston to Philly to Los Angeles to Seattle. Everywhere that you can think of probably has some type of critics group or some way for critics, film critics, film journalists to be involved. And I wanted to look and see, as they started giving out awards, can they actually predict what would happen in the, in the end and what did end up happening a week ago? So a few things of note. I looked at 57 critics groups. And with these critics groups, sometimes there were ties. So you may see for like best picture that there were a total of like 58 entries, but that's mostly because some groups can have ties. Even though it's a rare occurrence, at least at the Oscars, there are always is like the possibility that ties can occur. So I looked at 57 critics groups. All of them will be listed in the description below. So you can go ahead and check them out. I also got all of the results with a combination of off-screen central and next best picture. Both of those sites will also be linked down below for your reading and enjoyment pleasure. Now, not all critics groups vote the same way. Some of them have just a leading performance compared to a lead actor and a lead actress, or they just have a screenplay category as compared to adapted screenplay or original screenplay. Uh, so that is one thing that may also occur, which is why some of the numbers might be a little weird or funky. And finally, what I decided to do was I just, whatever the results were, I matched them to the Oscars. So even if there was just a screenplay category, whoever ended up winning, I decided to place those results in whether or not they qualified for original screenplay or adapted screenplay. For example, Barbie won not just a lot of screenplay categories, but a lot of original screenplay categories. And even though the Oscars said that was adapted, I decided to put that screenplay into adapted to see what the results would be from that. This is just for fun. This is just an interesting look. I just love numbers. I love doing this research and things like that. And I hope to be a part of these critics groups someday. I did not include the critics groups though of like the, who vote for like Critics Choice or the Hollywood Critics Association who vote for the uh, Astro Awards just because those are televised events where they give like physical trophies and things like that. I wanted to focus more on the groups that like just kind of give like these honorary awards because I think that's fun. We are also going to go in the order that was presented at the Oscars again because I think that's entertaining. So the first category that we're going to be looking at is Best Supporting Actress. And this was Divine Joy Randolph's year. She was in The Holdovers. She played a cook uh, that stayed at the school with Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sessa. And I absolutely agree with this. I think that she was outstanding. I think that she was the heart and soul of that film. She pulled those boys together and it was her year. So both the critics and the Oscars decided to vote for Divine Joy Randolph to give her that award. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. So what I have here with this pie chart is all of the people who have won over the course of the critics groups. And as you can see, Divine Joy Randolph was a standout, a blow away. She had the biggest percentage here with 82.1% of the vote, getting 46 out of the possible combinations. But we also have Jodie Foster, who was nominated alongside her, and Danielle Brooks, who was also nominated beside her, both of who had won at various critics groups. But then Julianne Moore in May, December was also a winner, uh, according to some groups, along with Rachel McAdams for Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. And again, these are just like winners. I didn't look at everyone who was nominated because that would have been way too much math. And I'm not about that much math. Next, we have Animated Feature. And this was such a fun one from the beginning because it seemed like 
such a blow away like that spider-man was going to take it and that did end up being the winner for the critics groups they did vote for spider-man across the spider-verse but then in the end i think because the boy and the heron started winning a lot of like tv awards uh average like kind of like televised award shows that's how it started to like kind of come up and that is what ended up being the winner which i am always happy with i love spider-man across the spider-verse i actually haven't seen the boy and the heron yet uh, but I've heard nothing but great things about it. I can't wait to see it. And I'm always happy when Studio Ghibli like comes out with a victory. But as we can see here, there is a much bigger difference between critics groups voting for uh, Spider-Man as opposed to The Boy and the Heron. As we see here, Spider-Man still had about the majority, the clear majority of the votes with, what does it say, 33 or 66% of the votes. And then Boy and the Heron did come in a nice second place with... 26% of the vote getting 13 actual wins and then Nimona and Robot Dreams both of who were also nominees did pick up a few wins as well which is always very nice. Original screenplay again what I did for this was that I just however the academy decided to break up the screenplay categories I just put them in their respective categories but the critics groups interestingly enough voted for the holdovers which I thought was really fun and interesting. I really did love the holdovers. I loved a lot of the movies this year. I think it was a really great year for film. But the ended up the ended up winner actually was Anatomy of a Fall, which is always really fun and interesting. I love seeing foreign films get recognition outside of the international feature film category and to see Anatomy of a Fall win for such an amazing screenplay was very very happy. I think that this started to pick up steam later on in the season compared to at the very beginning of the season when these critics groups usually come out and vote. But I loved seeing that win. And especially when the orchestra played the 50 Cent song as they were walking up and accepting their award. But the holdovers didn't really win with as much of flying colors as I expected it to. Uh, it ended up here with 16 votes, which is a total of 37.2% of the overall winners. But the next closest one, my personal favorite of the year, was Past Lives with 15 votes. It only squeaked out by one vote to be the favorite amongst critics groups. Anatomy of a Fall did come in third place with six wins, followed by May, December with five wins. And then Maestro even got a win in there as well. And looking at the screenplays, these are all the ones that actually were uh, nominated for Best Original Screenplay. So it doesn't surprise me that they all picked up a win somewhere. For Adapted Screenplay, the overall winner for the critics groups actually ended up being Oppenheimer, which I'm okay with. I really walked away from that film being like, man, that was a talky film, but I understood everything. I seemed to get everything. And I really liked the way that it was structured. But the Academy decided to go for American fiction. And I've heard back and forth things about this. I really did like Cord Jefferson's speech about, um, you know, making more independent, more smaller budget films, not worrying about taking that big risk. And so hearing that and seeing that, I think is great. But American fiction didn't even come in second place to Oppenheimer when it came to the critics. Barbie actually did. It came in second place, let's see, with nine votes in total or 21.4% while Oppenheimer had 13 votes or wins, I guess I should say, which equaled out to be 31% of the vote. Then American Fiction was very closely behind Barbie. It makes me wonder how close Barbie actually was in potentially winning this category. I don't know if American Fiction didn't win. I guess it probably would have been Oppenheimer was in second place. But who knows? According to this, it just kind of looks like Barbie was a lot closer than we may have thought. Some other uh movies that ended up winning this category in a variety of critics groups was are you there god it's me margaret poor things killers of the flower moon and all of us strangers this one had a lot more diversity and i really love seeing that other films were able to actually go ahead and win this category because a screenplay is so important and i love it i love reading screenplays i love looking deeper into what is there in the story and I love seeing all this variety. Makeup and hairstyling. One of the categories I actually ended up predicting wrong. I thought it was going to go to Maestro but apparently the critics and the Academy thought that poor things deserved it which for you know Willem Dafoe's face for Emma Stone's hair changing throughout it. It doesn't surprise me that this ended up winning as well. I really would have liked to see Maestro walk away with this as 
much as they did with Bradley Cooper and his old age makeup, transforming him, diving him deep into that character of Leonard Bernstein. But I am not surprised that poor things ended up on top. But when it came to the critics groups, not a lot of them voted for makeup and hairstyling. And as you can see here, there was only about eight groups that did that I was able to find information for, where five of them ended up voting for poor things and three of them voted for Barbie. Barbie wasn't even nominated. I don't even think it got shortlisted. Um, so that wouldn't have even been a competition. Maestro didn't win this according to the other groups. And so... Um, yeah, Barbie would have been second place, but it wasn't even up for the possibility. Production design, another one I got wrong because I wanted to see those Barbie dream houses win and apparently the critics agreed with me. I loved those dream houses. Even though I didn't have one as a child, I had like what, the, the, the train, it was like a sleeper car train. I'll put a picture here somewhere, but it was amazing. I loved this train. It had everything I needed and it wasn't as big as a house. So I could like store it nice and easy in my Barbie closet. Um, it wasn't necessarily a Barbie closet. It was just an extra closet, but it had all my Barbies in it. So it was my Barbie closet. Poor things ended up winning again. I think what I really was confused about, and I guess this does go into production design as well. I just felt like the Barbiness with Barbie land was so immersive and felt so real. Like it felt like those were plastic and those were toys. Whereas poor things, while did have great production design, they just kind of recreated cities. And I think there was a lot of green screen like I'm using right now uh, to kind of create those backgrounds. And maybe that's just me. Maybe there was better um, use of actual tangible things besides just like the craziness that was happening behind them but i'm not upset about it i really did enjoy poor things and it was a technical masterpiece as you can see from this pie chart oh my gosh critics groups absolutely devoured the production design of barbie it has what is it 91.7 percent of all wins with poor things only getting one and shout out to i think I was looking this up. I think this is a Florida group that voted for Asteroid City to win Best Production Design. Thank you for actually having some class and for actually knowing what good production design is. Costume design. I did vote for poor things in this. I was nervous. I'm like, should I split it? Should I go all Barbie? Should I go all poor things? I decided to split it. And I think a lot of people were the opposite of me where they had poor things for production design and Barbie for costumes. I feel like I was one of the only ones who had it reversed where I had Barbie in production design and poor things in costumes, but costumes did end up going to poor things at the Academy, even though the critics thought that Barbie was the winner for this, which I agree with. But I can also see that kind of also along with production design that it was more of recreating what was popular and what was already created for different outfits and dream houses for Barbie. But that doesn't mean that it still wasn't a masterpiece. And from this pie chart, again, you can see not very many groups voted for costume design, but an overwhelming majority of them, 76.5%, did decide that Barbie had the better costumes for the story, where only, what is this, 23.5% thought that poor things did. So not as big of a runaway as before when it came to production design, but still the majority was in favor of Barbie. And I did wish that Barbie won some technical category, whether it be costumes or production design. I would have preferred protection design, but that's just me. International feature. Now this one is a little interesting because... Anatomy of a Fall did not qualify to be France's pick for international feature. I think it's because Justine Trier, the director and writer, has some beef with like the president of France, if I read this correctly, uh, how she was trying to advocate for better funding for the arts. And because of this beef, France, I guess it wasn't the president. Maybe it was like whoever is the president of like the arts people um who <laughs> like the president of the francis hollywood or whatever i guess maybe they were the person because it doesn't seem like it'd be an issue for like actual france but anyway um i think that's what i heard and that's why the taste of things was france's nomination instead of anatomy of a fall but honestly i'm not really sure if that's true i think that's just what i heard or read somewhere online um, I hope it's true because that is hilarious. Critics groups did go for Anatomy of a Fall to be their pick, 
But the Oscars ended up voting for The Zone of Interest, which is a harrowing movie that I loved but never want to see again. It's one of those where I appreciate it and I respect it. And it is a great movie. But man, I can't see it again. Or it's not one out of like the Best Picture nominees that I'm itching to go and revisit super quickly, if that makes sense. But the zone of interest wasn't that far away when it came to Anatomy of a Fall. It actually ended up in second place. Anatomy of a Fall won in 22 different votes or won 22 different times, which equals out to about 45.8% of the total wins, where the zone of interest came in second place with 15 wins or 33.1%. But I think what's fun here is that Godzilla minus one was in third place for wins. Again, this is wins, not nominations. And I love that for them. I still haven't seen the film, but a lot of my non into award season friends love this movie. And I'm so happy that it did very well with critics groups because that's just so fun and so interesting and i i love that next we have supporting actor and kind of like divine joy randolph this was robert downey jr's to lose he had been winning in critics groups he had been winning in all of the major events so it was no surprise that he won out for the critics groups and that he also won out for the academy oppenheimer was a super big cast and i do love robert downey jr with all of my heart but I just thought that there were other performances that I enjoyed more than him's. Maybe that doesn't necessarily mean that his wasn't the best. Personally, I really liked uh, Benny Safdie's performance, and I think that should have gotten some recognition. But I understand. I think Robert Downey Jr. is definitely the biggest supporting role in that film. So that's probably why he stood out more. And again, I really do love Robert Downey Jr. So I'm happy that he was able to walk away with this from both the critics and the Academy. But Ryan Gosling was in a clear second place for his role in Barbie. I really do appreciate that. I think people are going to take and have been taking comedic roles more seriously because just because someone is in a funny part, like I believe Melissa McCarthy was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress for uh, Bridesmaids. And I'm really happy about that. I'm really happy that these types of roles are being looked at with how much work it takes to do something like this. I remember when Ryan Gosling was first announced and people are like, Ugh. Is that really going to be him? Is that really going to be the part that we're going for? And he was phenomenal in it. And I think he really did deserve this type of recognition for his part. But as we can see here, Charles Melton was in a clear third place in a very well-deserved third place with the amount of wins that he got from the critics groups. I'm really disappointed I did not see him. The way he was able to just be an adult man in his like have the adult man body I mean with being so small and childlike because of the mental stunt that he had from being with Julianne Moore's character I thought it was absolutely fabulous and coming from a place like Riverdale where the acting is not necessarily the best but he was so great in that performance. And people like Coleman Domingo for The Color Purple, Mark Ruffalo, Dominic Sessa all got wins here and there, and I'm very happy for them as well. Visual effects was also another fun one. It ended up going to Godzilla minus one for both the critics and the Academy. Again, I haven't seen this movie yet, but the love behind this film, not just from the creators of the actual film itself, but from fans and this franchise and how much recognition it's never gotten before and to see a Godzilla film come and win and did you guys see their shoes the visual effects designer shoes they were so adorable I love their shoes I'm so happy for them they had little Godzilla figures at the awards and it was so much fun I'm so happy a small independent film like this, especially from a much beloved franchise, got their recognition. I think it is the smallest awards ever or smallest budget, excuse me, to win visual effects. And I'm so very happy for them for that. However, the creator wasn't that far behind. I haven't heard the best things about the creator, but I did hear that the best part of it was the visual effects. And as you can see here, it almost tied with Godzilla. It was in a very, very close second place. Oppenheimer also was not too far behind in third. And then some other winners were Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, uh, Poor Things, Society of the Snow. That's a fun win. And Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 as well. 
I don't think a Marvel film has won yet for visual effects. That sounds about right. And I'm happy, again, that Godzilla, that franchise, finally got their first win. Editing, again, I think this was another film that it was Oppenheimer's to lose. Jennifer Lame did an amazing job making this three-hour film not feel that long and they didn't just make the bomb of course that's the fun the exciting parts but they also were able to bring in this courtroom drama as well and be able to tie that in with the making of the atomic bomb and the aftermath of that I think was really fascinating and it flowed very well and I really loved the pacing of this film at times it did get a little talky but not necessarily in a negative way but in an important way because of the story that was being told and critics groups clearly agreed I mean if you're looking at these stats what is this about 75 percent of all of the wins for best editing went to Oppenheimer from the critics groups so clearly they know what they're talking about. What else? We have Killers of the Flower Moon in second place with 10.7% of the vote. I also really did like Killers of the Flower Moon's editing. It's longer, about 30 minutes longer than Oppenheimer, but it still flowed. It didn't feel that long. I know some people think that there were some points that should have been left out or that because of the editing, it felt long. I don't think that's true at all, Thelma my goddess, my queen, working with Scorsese all these years. I think you did a fantastic job. And if the Oscar went to you instead of Jennifer Lame, I would not have been upset about that. Yes, it is a long movie, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has poor editing. I think it worked really well. I really enjoyed it. It was one of my favorite edited films. But Oppenheimer also is another greatly edited film. Both both films were just so good. And yes, they were long, but it's okay to have long movies as long as they don't feel like long movies. I went to see Argyle in theaters and that is like two and a half hours. And that felt like five. Like that is when editing is bad. And when you just can't cut something or when it doesn't make sense because, oh my gosh, I just... <laughs> Ugh. it seemed like a movie made for me and it was so bad and I'm okay with bad movies but man it was just so long and that is because of editing just because a movie is long doesn't mean the editing is bad it could just be put together horribly and then you end up with something like Argyle documentary feature this one was interesting because critics overwhelmingly went with still a Michael J Fox movie but this one wasn't even nominated was it even shortlisted I think it was I can't remember off the top of my head but uh critics ended up or excuse me the academy ended up picking 20 days in mario pole which i haven't seen yet but i heard that it is heartbreaking that it is so sad because of everything going on with it and i really liked what the creator had to say about it saying i wish i didn't make this documentary because of everything that is happening and the fact that he won the Oscar and is like, I wish I didn't, that I think says a lot about the subject matter that you're working with and dealing with. And I think that really impacted me and I can't wait to see it whenever I can. But 20 Days of Mario poll wasn't too far behind from critics groups as well. As you can see here, it came in second place with 10 uh, wins or 18.5% of the vote, where still had 40.7% of the wins. I was really surprised that American Symphony didn't get nominated just because the song got nominated and it's John Baptiste and I'm not familiar with his music, but I know that he's a popular artist. So I really am surprised that that didn't get nominated, but hey, I'm not the documentary branch. I haven't seen it yet either. I'm really behind on documentaries this year. I'm usually pretty good. Um, the only documentary I've seen and apparently counts as a documentary, and that's the only reason why I'm calling that, is The Eras Tour. And that's kind of sad. <laughs> it was great. I, that's how, I am not a concert person. And being able to sit in the theater, and it was my local theater, so it wasn't crowded. I got to sit in my sweatpants and just relax. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon. It was great. Uh, I could sit the entire time. I wasn't surrounded by a whole bunch of people. I didn't have to pick a fancy outfit and then be uncomfortable in that fancy outfit. It, that's how I need to experience all concerts, is what I'm saying. So I think all concerts should be filmed for not just potentially um, to benefit 
the people behind the concerts who put them on or like the videographers, but also like the disabled community or those who may not be able to get in big crowds uh, and for lazy people like me. Cinematography, again, I think this was another one for Oppenheimer to lose. Hoyt Van Hoytema has been outstanding in so many films that I'm surprised he hasn't won an Oscar yet so far. And his work on Oppenheimer is no different. This was a well-deserved award win from both a majority of the critics and also the Academy. Because as you can see here, critics, it was an absolute runaway with Killers of the Flower Moon and Poor Things both being in second place with only five wins each. Uh, Oppenheimer having 70.2% of that vote. It's not surprising to me. It was amazingly shot. And like I said, I'm very happy for Hoyt Van Hortema. He deserves this. Sound. Sound is a really interesting category because I think that it could be looked at in two different ways. And basically those were the results that we got. Uh, obviously the atomic bomb, the chills that you feel when that happens is outstanding and incredible. And I think one of the, the scenes that stands out to me the most for Oppenheimer sound is the one right after the bomb was set off in Japan, like in the, like the school stadium, when they're all in the stadium, the wood things. Oh my goodness. That was like a horror scene. And it felt so real and scary. And it's not a scary thing, but because of everything that was happening and surrounding you, it just felt horrifying. Like I would not want to be in that situation. But then you have something like the zone of interest where the sound is part of the story where it would be a completely different film if you didn't have the sound work that it did. And so I'm not surprised here that Oppenheimer won with the critics groups. I think it was in a very close second place for the Academy, but I'm glad that the Academy saw how the sound affects the zone of interest and you do not have a story you do not have a film you do not have anything without that sound not a lot of critics groups had sound i think there was about 10 overall winners um as you can see here it, all nearly all of them went to oppenheimer which again i completely understand i completely get but one of them also went to ferrari which i was surprised wasn't nominated because car movies and usually like airplane movies usually get those awards or at least those nominations. So I'm really surprised Ferrari wasn't up for sound. Another one that was kind of Oppenheimer's to lose was best original score. Same thing with like cinematography. It plays such an amazing vital part to the film. And it's, I can't wait to find out on vinyl. I need to get it, but it's so expensive and it's so sold out. Uh, but uh, like I can just, I'm playing the sound in my head as I am doing this video. And it's something that hasn't left my mind since. It has been probably the one movie soundtrack I can't get out of my head this year. The next best one, in my opinion, was also the one that ended up getting uh, the most second place wins from critics groups, and that is Killers of the Flower Moon, another amazing uh, score. And I, I wouldn't have been upset of this one too, but I really do think it was Oppenheimer's to lose for this entire season. Not a lot of groups voted for best original song, but there was only two that groups did either vote for for the winning, and that was either I'm Just Ken, which ended up winning the critics groups, or What Was I Made For, that ended up winning the Academy Award, both from Barbie, both amazing. That Ken performance was outstanding, definitely the best thing to happen that night, but I really do love what was I made for? Congratulations to Billy and Phineas on their second win at such a young age. I'm more Ken doesn't surprise. I'm more Ken. I'm just Ken doesn't surprise um, me for how much it was popular and it did hit with fans and critics. And I think it is an important part of the movie as well. Not as important as what was I made for, but I definitely am singing. I'm just Ken a lot more than I am what was I made for. And that's not necessarily because what was I made for is bad. It's just because I'm just Ken is catchy. All right, last few big ones. We have leading actor that went to Killian Murphy for his amazing performance as uh, Oppenheimer. Uh, the critics thought he was great. The Academy thought he was great. I thought he was great. And clearly that's the only 
one that matters the most. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me. He was able to transform into that role. And from the minute I saw him, I'm like, that is a leading man performance. That is a leading winning performance. And I could not imagine anyone else beating him. Actually, that's not true because I really did like Paul Giamatti in the holdovers who, as you can see here, ended up coming in second place. So if he won, I wouldn't have been surprised. I do think the Academy still likes its biopic and is biopic biased. Um, so that's why I thought that Killian Murphy definitely had that win unless some other major performance came in. But I wasn't surprised that this uh, was the winning performance, especially because of not just creating the bomb, but what happened afterwards as well. And I think that's also why it wasn't just the story of the creation of the atomic bomb. It was all those court hearings afterwards. How did it affect him personally? And I think that's just as important a story to tell. But Jeffrey Wright ended up coming in third for American Fiction. Love that for him. But then Coleman Domingo, uh, Bradley Cooper, Andrew Scott, a whole bunch of other nominees as well. Another kind of easy throwaway win that you could just check off on your bracket or your ballot not your bracket it's March Madness time but on your ballot and that was Christopher Nolan for director for directing Oppenheimer I don't think there's anything more I can say Christopher Nolan congratulations everything about this film was done the way it was because of the team that you picked because of the way you went about this film everything about it just made sense and this was your award to lose and I'm very happy that you now have an Oscar and clearly critics thought so as well but then also Jonathan Glazer came out with a few wins for the zone of interest and that made me really happy Greta Gerwig and Martin Scorsese also pulled out that third place tie and that doesn't surprise me either both amazing films and just I can't wait to see what else these directors have up their sleeve. Leading actress. This was probably the award that was the most up in the air, the closest race that I've seen in a while. Like maybe even closer than Kate Planchette and Michelle Yeoh last year. Uh, but critics ended up voting for Lily Gladstone. And basically up until the night of, I think everyone thought that Lily Gladstone had this in the bag as well due to a lot of precursors especially with her SAG award win right before the end of voting and right before um the ceremony happened but Emma Stone did end up winning this is actually who I did have on my bracket oh, ballot not bracket bracket time is now ballot time was last time um but I don't think I'm very surprised by that win for Emma Stone I think the academy really does like showy performances and mostly because they just stick out more, but that doesn't necessarily mean that more subtle and nuanced and soul performances don't deserve this type of award. And I would have really liked to see Lily Gladstone win because she was a heart and soul of that movie. I think she definitely should have been campaign campaigning in lead. May she may have won when if she decided to compete in supporting, but I would not consider her supporting performance. There's a lot of talk also about just how much screen time really matters. And I don't think that really does. And even here, you can see that it was relatively close between Emma Stone and Lily Gladstone as well. Lily Gladstone had 48.3% of wins, while Emma Stone had 36.7% of wins. Others who ended up winning was Sandra Huller for Anatomy of a Fall. Great. Love that. And Anjanou Ellis Taylor for Origin also showed up a little bit. I'm like, okay. Um, I still need to see that movie, but I've heard great things things about it and I really do wish it got a little bit more of a wider push but of course the big one of the night picture again this was Oppenheimer's to lose it was such a well-crafted film with so many people behind it that cared so much about it and if this didn't win best picture I don't know what would have because I don't really think there was a very close second place probably based on reports and analyses that I've watched, maybe the holdovers, maybe poor things, probably poor things. But I really did think this was another one for like it was Oppenheimer's from the beginning. And clearly critics thought so too, with Oppenheimer getting 34.5% of the wins. Past Lives coming in second place with 15.5%. Thank you, critics, for again having taste. Killers of the Flower Moon was in third place then, right after Past Lives with 13.8% of the wins. And then you can see here a lot of the Best Picture nominees 
uh, for the Academy also ended up with a lot of actual wins themselves throughout the various critics groups. And I love to see that diversity. Yes, even though this did feel like Oppenheimer's to lose, I'm glad that so many awards or so many films got so many awards and so much recognition that at least one critic group thought, yeah, All of Us Strangers is the best picture of the year. Or that The Zone of Interest is the best picture of the year. And I love that. All right. I am done. That is it. This is long, but I really loved compiling all this data. Again, I'll list all of the critics groups and uh, Off Screen Central and Next Best Picture down in the description below. This is where I was able to compile all of this data. So let me know how you did on your Oscar ballots this year. I got 20 out of 23 because I am just that great. Uh, but let me know how you guys thought of the Oscars, what you thought of the ceremony. Did you like it? Did you think it was bad? Was I'm Just Ken the best part of the night? Let me know all of that and more down in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, keep on gabbing.